Hello everyone, my name is Michał Dominiak, I am a student at Wrocław University of Technology and I also work at Nokia Networks and this is your crash course on functors and monads. Okay, so we are going, I am going to say something about noticing patterns. Uh, there will be a mostly wrong analogy for functors. Then we will go for functors, go take a quick path without mentioning something. Uh, we talk, we will talk about monads and some, and I will tell something about the do notation. Okay, so this is a slide straight from my previous talk. So some types have common operations and it's useful to be able to do those common operations the same way for those types. And people tend to focus too much on patterns they were taught. So patterns they, wrote, they read about in one particular book. And they tend not to notice patterns in code as they are writing and rather trying to force a, those patterns they were taught into code even when it doesn't make any sense. So uh, we'll try with a, an analogy here. So a functor and uh, okay, so whenever I say a functor, do not confuse that with the uh, common C++ meaning of the world, of the word. And if I, uh, the way I will refer to the C++ functors is function objects. Okay, so a functor is a box. <laughs> In that box is a value or no value or many values. Uh, do they have the same type? I don't know, it's a box. So it allows you to look into the box and call a function on the value or not. There is no value. Or call it multiple times. Or actually different functions. So we have something that wraps a value and allows you to call functions on it. And There is a particular class of, uh, a, let's say, monad tutorials that, I try, that are trying to explain the concept with an analogy. Uh, one most uh, known is probably this one. A monad is a burrito. So uh, someone wrote some text about how a monad is like a burrito and Someone else tried to figure out why it's like a burrito and apparently he was wrong. <laughs> so uh, trying to find an analogy is not really very helpful. And uh, at some point I found a tutorial that was like <coughs> 10 parts blog post that was showing use cases of various types and how they are common and that was actually useful. And that went for examples. I didn't try to start with an abstract definition. I expect most of you are familiar with the a monad is just a monoid in the category of endofunctors. <laughs> What's the problem? So th this is not a correct way to explain this. <laughs> And a monad is not a burrito. Okay, so. And a functor isn't really a box. Okay, so we have this beautiful type called optional T. T. <coughs> there is one in boost, there is one proposed, I think accepted for standard. So it contains either no value or a value. 
you can check whether the value is there or not. You can create an empty optional, that's the <coughs> default constructor. You can create an optional containing a value that's called make optional. You can call a function on the value inside, although that's not a functionality that's really given out of the box and it looks like something like, looks something like this. So we check whether the optional is engaged or whatever is the <coughs> current terminology for that in the standard. And if it is, you call the function with the dereferenced optional, otherwise you return nothing. And Okay, so this is pretty nice. You can call it, the best way to use this is actually wrap it in a function that takes an optional and a function. It's pretty handy. Okay, so next we have a vector of this. And a vector contains zero or more values. You can check how many values are there. You can create, or create a vector of arbitrary number of elements. And you can call a function on all the values. <coughs> and that looks something like this. I hope there is no typo in there. So you create a, a vector. You probably want to reserve some data for it in there, some space for it in there. And you call a standard algorithm. Okay. So that's pretty straightforward. Again, it's good to have this in the form of a function so you don't have to repeat yourself every time. There is this type called a future of t. So it contains a value that may appear there in the future or is already there, whatever. You can check whether the value is there or not. And you can create a ready future with make ready future, also creating it right now without the addition of make ready future is kind <coughs> of hard and painful. Uh, and it's pretty much similarly painful for exceptional future, but you can do it. It's doable. And you can, you can call a function on the value. Again, with the, with the ad proposed additions. So if we don't want to care about the exceptional case, just want to have a value passed and call a function on it, we can do something like this. So we just call the then, unwrap the future. Oh, sorry, get the value from the future because unwrap means something else. And that's it. So those are, those are functors. And uh, I'm not trying to give you mathematical definitions. I could, but that's not, that is not really useful for uh, grasping the concept for use, for everyday use. Okay, so it's a type. It wraps other type. And it exposes a function. And implementations of the, that function were the snippets on the previous three slides. So that's fmap for optional for vector and for future. So why is it called fmap? Because we're cl cl clearly just mapping a, value, uh, a function onto a value or more values. It's called fmap because uh, Haskell doesn't support uh, the overloading and in very early versions there was a function called map that was basically fmap on lists but since that was shipped they, can, they couldn't change it but I will keep using fmap since it's easy to distinguish from standard map okay so the type of fmap in Haskell notation because the C++ notation isn't really uh, very useful in general. It looks something like this. So it's a function that takes a function from A to B. A and B are types. 
f is a particular vector, uh, a particular factor. So f map takes a function and takes a functor and returns a functor of the same type. So uh, the arrows are there written this way in case you don't know the uh, Haskell function type notation because all functions in Haskell are carried. So uh, every function in Haskell is, uh, takes one argument. So this is actually a, a function which takes a function and returns a function which takes a functor and returns a functor. That's why it's spelled that way. Okay. So, uh, the generic way isn't to write that in C++ isn't really nice. There, let's not go there. I can show you some implementation of it for particular types later. But in general, to write to write it in C++ for all possible types, that's not nice. Okay, so uh, we have seen those fmaps before. So variant, variant. So a type which can hold a value of one of multiple types, just one. So I, it's like an union, but only tagged. So you always know which type actually is in there. Can be a functor. In Haskell, it's kind of not pretty because Haskell doesn't have function overloading. So in Haskell, there is something called by functor and the equivalent of fmap looks like this. So it takes two functions, a functor and returns a functor. In C++ that is actually pretty much, pretty, uh, prettier. Okay, that's, that's how I wanted to say that. So you can just take a vector, a overloaded function, uh, sorry, a variant and overloaded function and visit the functor and return a new, new variant of proper types. Uh, okay, so fmap is great and it's really useful. It may not be completely visible that it's really, really useful right now, but think of every time you wrote standard transform. Creating the vector first, probably reserving the memory, calling the algorithm, with iterators, that's not nice. So fmap is really, really nice, especially when you want to write even more generic code. You cannot, for example, call a standard algorithm or on optional. You can call fmap on optional. And uh, it returns a functor. So it returns a value in the same category. Sorry, I lied to you. So those, func those functors for that implement fmap in this way are endofunctors. So they, there is a mapping from a functor to a functor of the same type. That's the that's probably the most complicated part of the uh, uh, monad is a monoid in the category of end of factors part. Uh, the, the definition, let's call it. Okay, so I like again. So, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I like again because I am going to mention applicative, but just for completion. It's a. Yeah, it's a functor where the function itself can be a functor. So you can have optional function and optional value and you can just call it. So it's something like this. It 
can be useful at times, but uh, it's not really important for the later part of the talk. Recently in Haskell there was a proposal to make or all monads automatically be applicative functors and that, I think that was accepted. So there are some mappings between the functions defined for applicative functor and monad. But let's not go there right now. Okay, so monads. So there is this magical function where all the all the fun stuff happens. It's called join and it flattens. This is again a wrong analogy for most for most monads. It makes sense, for example, for a list, for a vector, where we are flattening it. But there probably are some cases where this analogy makes no sense. So we have an optional optional. So boost optional of boost optional of t. And we want to have an optional of t. So if the outer optional is engaged, if there is a value in it, we just return that value. If there is no value in there, we return nothing. So if in either of those optional there is boost none instead of a value, we get boost none. Otherwise we get the value from down below. So that's that's nice. For vector it's not pre not as pretty because we have to again flatten flatten it. So this could probably be written in several ways, including different kinds of, of loops, different algorithms, but the idea is the same. So uh, join is a function where we have a monad inside which is a monad of a type and we return like single level monad. Yeah, this is different for some functors. Uh, I couldn't really find a functor for which this makes no sense. But whenever you encounter a functor when, where this makes no sense, the, then automatically it's not a monad. It's just a factor. But otherwise, we get a monad. So there we can define a function which calls fmap, then calls join. The idea is that we are fmapping a function that, again, for optional returns an optional. So just fmap, just fmap with, we would leave us with optional, optional of t. But we want just a single level of optional. Yeah. OK. So let's call it m bind, so monadic bind. So in Haskell, this is done with an operator, infix operator. And in, it looks like this takes a monad, it takes a function from the value into the same monad, and returns a monad. Okay, makes sense? And it's defined like this. So x m bind f is calling join on the result of calling f map with f, with f and x being the arguments. In C++, we cannot just do that because the uh, associa associativity is wrong. So we would get bizarre results. I don't know what's the best operator to use here. So I, I really don't know. And calling it like a function usually makes the code not readable enough. But I guess whichever operator you choose for this, it will be okay. It will work. So in C++ mbind is pretty much like, like this one up there. Sometimes it's easier to implement 
and bind and not join and make join just work uh, by using identity function. For example, for optional, it might be easier to actually implement and bind instead of instead of join. But it doesn't matter. All, the end result is the exact same thing. So a monad is a functor. Every monad is a functor, so there is a value in there, or more values, or no value. Uh, a monad can be used to represent a sequence of steps of computation. So when talking about optional, we have an, a computation that can fail, or a sequence of computations that can fail at any given point. If we are talking about a future, we have a sequence of asynchronous operations that are to be called. And monads are sometimes called programmable semicolons because monadic bind is kind of like a semicolon, that, but you can control what exactly it does. Okay, so do notation. You probably heard about it at least once. And it probably was like, haha, C++ doesn't have do notation. It's not nice. So it's a shorthand for monadic bind. For example, do something becomes something like this. Okay, so backslash something means a, a lambda which a lambda and names its argument something so later we can use that in function calls the underscore basically means we this is a lambda it takes a value but we don't care about the value so this up there calls foo saves its result then calls bar, then calls bus something. Unless there was a problem if this is an optional or maybe. So this pretty much makes sense, right? And yeah, if foo is successful, then we call bar. If bar is successful also, we call bus. But that reminds us, reminds you of something, right? That's like, kind of like this. This is pretty much the same. Or, or the almost exact equivalent of that is, right? <laughs> so if that if that monad here was an optional, then, or rather something that saves the information about why the computation failed, then this is the same. So people say that there's no do notation in C++ and uh, <laughs> there is no try. <laughs> it's, it's just do. Uh, okay, so during my previous talk, I said something about not liking uh, the idea that pure functions as proposed for C++, there was a proposal for uh, attribute pure, and it defined those functions as not throwing. I couldn't throw. And I just cannot like agree with that uh, approach because uh, throwing an exception is pretty much the same as returning an error monad. Exceptions are monadic. We can convert them into values that are being returned. So I do not see a reason not to allow exceptions to be thrown from pure functions. 
Uh, okay, and that would be it. Any questions? So as proposed, pure had no exceptions. Uh, uh, kind of, yes. It would, it would imply that. Yes. For those who have not been initiated to functional programming, uh, the Mac that kind of predates all of this, which is, I guess, is it type theory, category theory, both what's the proper name for this? It's category theory. And what theory, would be like yeah. the gentle introduction for those of us who say got our degrees more like the engineering stuff where we started with, you know, like... So, stuff. introduction to category theory. Okay, so, uh, there is a C++ slash Haskell programmer or whose name is Bartosz Milewski. He has a blog and on that blog he posted some, some posts about category theory. I think it was titled something like a category theory for C++ programmers or something like that. So uh, I can say I did read all of that but from the first few posts, it looked like a nice, gentle introduction to this stuff. Yeah. I think he's working on a book. Yes, yes, you are, I think you are right. He's working on a book, yeah. Yeah. Just sort of the, that idea that a pure won't grow. Is the idea behind that because when you throw an exception, it has to be caught outside the block? It seems like your return is your, you know, what you're getting back. So because if you throw is something that happens outside that return, it's necessarily kind of stable. A, um, so w would you say that multiple return points from a function uh, is a, a stateful, a stateful thing? Uh, that is something we generally try to avoid, at least in, in, in my practice. We consider that. So you do not like multiple, like having multiple return statements in a statements in a function. No. Although oh. implicitly, implicitly, there is one with exceptions. There is, there are multiple exit points in a function with exceptions. That's all there is. But generally, or typically, the logic flow is you like a single point of return. I like, uh, like, I like early returns from function where I. This is a condition, I know I won't do anything else here. Everything else in this function happens in the exact opposite condition. So I return from the function. Instead, in the other case, I would have to make like one intendation level more. So either it would be if blah 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 something else, or if not something, and that makes the code like wider. I don't like that. When I just return, I can omit the if else block and just write code. Okay, thank you.